The slide on the left is the city of Carson, a typical suburban house in the city of Carson. The slide on the right is a typical suburban house in the city of Cudahy, which is about seven miles to the east of Carson. Carson's population uh, from the 1990 census is 4,500 people per square mile. Cudahy's population is 20,000 people per square mile. And this isn't the only single family house in that city that I took a picture of. This is typical for the um, housing there. As a comparison, Los Angeles is 7,500 people per square mile. Santa Monica is 10,000 per square mile. Both cities look similar on the outside. Um, next, Carson's on the left, Cudahy's on the right, except that Cudahy has lot sizes that are about 400 feet deep, and they've just replicated the typical suburban uh, planning situation of the suburban house several times down the length of the lot. Cudahy also has a severe overcrowding problem. Each single family house has about two to three, not every one of them, but a lot of them have two to three families living in them. In the city of LA, 85% of the land area is zoned single family. 15% is zoned for multifamily or condo use. And if you do the math with our population, that means that 1.5 million people live on 85% of the land and 2.3 million people are squeezed into the 15% of the land that's for multifamily. Next. On the left is low density sprawl, which is about four to six units per net acre. Um, on the right is Tom Gilmore's project in downtown LA, which is a, over 200 units per acre. Just to give you, I'm going to start talking about density, and these are kind of the two ends of the spectrum. In Los Angeles, 61% of us are renters compared to 34% nationally. The city of LA creative, created the Adaptive Reuse Ordinance, which allows conversion of commercial buildings downtown to residential uses without having to upgrade the buildings to current seismic or parking codes. This has resulted in about 4,000 new housing units being built downtown. Um, and Tom Gilmore's project, I should say, um, at that density doesn't provide parking or, uh, or has to provide open space. Jane Jacobs um, has said that we should look at density the way that we look at calories. The right amount depends on the situation or the size of the person. Uh, we should build high density with reduced parking because it makes sense near transit or commercial hubs. Next. These are kind of dark, but this is Charleston, South Carolina. Charleston has a very dense mixed-use downtown core, um, probably partly because it was founded in the 1700s. Um, because of the density, they have created what's called a livability court, which is outside of their municipal court to deal with issues that arise with high-density living, uh, like your neighbor's dog that barks all night, um, and things like that. Charleston has become very exclusive and is not at all affordable. Massachusetts, to ensure their supply of affordable housing, created what they call the Anti-Snob Zoning Initiative. In any political jurisdiction, if the affordable housing supply is less than 10% of the total, zoning ordinances which interfere with the development of affordable housing are deemed discriminatory and can be ignored. Um, so for instance, if you have a neighborhood that has a zoning code that says, uh, it's a two acre minimum lot size for a single family house and they don't meet their quota of affordable housing, you can build multifamily on that lot. Um, and this has been in operation for a while. They say that it's working and they found that this also helps to geographically disperse the income levels. Next. On the left is um, HUD housing in Venice at a density of 21 units per net acre. On the right is um, an affordable housing project that um, our office, Pew Scarpa, did in Willowbrook, California at the same density. And they look very different, as you can see. Um, 
they're the same density both projects are in existing residential neighborhoods and my point is that um, design and site planning do matter next this is the Willowbrook our Willowbrook project on the left is the site plan um, originally the project was supposed to be a prototype that could be put on uh, the same size lot in the neighborhood um, and you can see something interesting that I that I also saw from the site plan our property was zoned C3 but if you look right behind our property the same size lots are zoned R1 and the lot sizes are 66 by 280 feet although we were working with typical uh, suburban setbacks we pushed the volume of the building to one side of the lot to capture as much of the exterior space as possible the driveway that you see is for the fire department um, because we don't have an alley in the back we needed fire department access because the lots 280 feet deep and this is also used for the tenants to drive to the parking which is in the rear of the lot and we had a different idea for the the landscaping uh, that ne that didn't get built next this is a project in Santa Monica that has a density uh, same density as the last project 21 units per net acre it's on Euclid Avenue and it's in the R2 zone it's on a lot that's 50 feet by 125 feet typical suburban lot it's three units for two brothers two of the units are 2,000 square feet um, and the last unit is a rental apartment that they're going to rent for um, additional income. We are incorporating photovoltaic solar panels into this project to generate electricity for the project. Next. Uh, all the units share the pool and the roof deck. Um, this was developed within current zoning codes. It has all of its required covered parking in a garage. Um, but as we develop these kinds of projects it makes um, apparent to us that both zoning and building codes and most of LA need to be revised to allow different types of housing to be built the denser that you build the greater uh, lot coverage you really need to allow um, the diversity of architectural types um, and this is not possible with typical suburban zoning um, with a single height limit everywhere and setbacks on all sides. In some residential areas, zero lot lines may be appropriate as well as a reduction in parking if it's near transit or commercial areas. In some cities of LA County, you can't build residential by right in commercial areas um, and no one wants to go through a public hearing to build affordable housing um, because then it, it's hard to get it built. This really lowers the amount of dense housing that may be built. The city of Palo Alto is updating their zoning code to provide an incentive for developers to actually build housing on top of parking lots that are near commercial centers or transit hubs. Next. This is another project that our office is working on, uh, which is on Orange Grove Avenue in West Hollywood, and the density is a little higher than the last project. This is 30 units per net acre, and it's in the commercial zone. It's five units on a 50 by 150 foot lot. Uh, each unit is 1,300 square feet each, and the units have their required two car covered parking spaces in a semi subterranean parking lot. Cost per square foot is about $110, um, and the developer wants to actually make this a prototype and replicate it on other lots in West Hollywood. Next. Sam Mockby used to say that architects should always be part of the initial design making process in order to challenge the status quo. Um, and that's part of the reason why I was a co-founder of Livable Places, which is a nonprofit company whose mission is to promote sustainable development via compact land use, sustainable technology, a mixture of uses, and a var variety of house types. We want to build affordable housing on unused or underutilized parcels of land in LA County. We are also working to change existing policy that promotes low density sprawl and to highlight infrastructure improvements, um, which will be needed as we increase the density. On the, on the right is a slide, a plan that Mark Mack did for an actual site that we're looking at to build housing on. 
Um, we're currently going through an experiment with a group of architects that are graciously giving us their, their time um, to help us finalize uh, what's called design guidelines, which is going to be a tool by which we will plan and build that will enable our projects to achieve a measure of sustainability and embody the diversity that a real city has. And we're doing things like testing out um, whether it's a good idea to have two different teams do the site planning and then have four different architects do the building, or if it should be one planner to do the site plan and then a variety of architects to do the planning. Um, Joan Ling is also on the board of Livable Places and Larry Scarpa and Roger Sherman's been helping us um, as well. Next. These are some slides that Ted Smith, some drawings that Ted Smith did for us for this experiment. Um, he, he was part of a team that initially would parcel the site for land use and density and then give their design to another architect to design the, the buildings next. Next. The international definition of sustainability is meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. The slide on the left is, is um, student work from SIARC, someone who is in Eric Kahn's housing studio. And it shows what our solid waste would look like as landfill. I believe sustainable issues must be integrated and have the same weight as the more formal aspects of architectural design. Next. <clears throat> this is Colorado Court, um, which is a sustainable project that Joan and Gary mentioned. Um, it's a project that we started four years ago for the Community Corporation of Santa Monica. It's 44 SRO units, and um, the density is 139 units per acre. It's actually five stories. It's four stories of wood frame construction above uh, one story of type one construction. The ground floor has community spaces, common spaces, and parking uh, for 20 cars. The site's in downtown Santa Monica right off the 10 freeway. It's a sustainable demonstration project. Uh, we've received grant money from the city, the state, and utility companies. The building will generate um, its electricity on site from two different sources. One source is the photovoltaic electric solar panels. The other is a microturbine, which is gas fired and sits on the roof of the building. The microturbine provides the base electrical load and we are, we are actually capturing the waste heat from the microturbine, which heats hot water tanks on the roof. Hot wa um, it's providing the domestic hot water for the building, and we're heating the units with a radiator system, so the turbine's waste heat is actually providing all of the heat for the units as well, um, and the units have no air conditioning. The solar panels provide the peak electrical load for the building. Um, we're using the utility grid as our storage. We don't have any batteries. Um, and the idea is that we have a net meter that runs in two directions. The city will allow you to um, rack up a credit on the grid that you can use at night when you flip on a light switch so that you get a zero utility bill um, at the end of the year, and that's the idea here. Next. It's in a commercial zone. Um, we didn't have any setbacks to deal with, but we're at our height limit. We wanted to create um, a building that would provide form to its exterior space um, and a building where someone can enter the unit from outside without having to enter into an enclosed corridor. We um, also wanted to design the building using passive energy features. Um, this led us to divide the units into narrow volumes oriented in the southwest northeast direction. Um, the prevailing breezes actually blow through between the volumes and operable windows on both sides of the units allow cross ventilation. We place the large windows for the units on the north side and on the south side, the exterior balconies and the sunscreen shade, shade um, that face. We're using a variety of inexpensive materials such as stucco, concrete block, and sheet metal um, as wrappers to articulate the building forms. Next. 
the most expensive um, wrapper that we used on the site is the solar panels, um, but they're also generating electricity. We really wanted to showcase their beauty by putting them on the facade of the building, um, and they also wrap around the roof. You lose a little bit of efficiency when you're in the vertical position rather the horizontal position, um, but not that much, and we felt that, that it was um, a trade-off and that both had to work together. Formal issues with um, the sustainable issues. Next. You, you can see from the diagram on the left, the volumes are only connected by um, an open exterior balcony. All of the units in each volume stack, stack exactly, um, which makes it a very efficient building construction. We created a second floor terrace, which, uh, which you can see on this slide, uh, the concrete block, which sits on top of the parking area, and it looks out over Fifth Street, and it ties the building forms together and provides private common outdoor space for the res residential use above the common use. Next. The walls are heavily insulated with uh, recycled blown in newsprint, which doubles the R value of a typical wall and roof construction. The windows are thermally protected as well. They're double glazed with a low E film and they're filled with krypton gas. Um, so that the entire envelope of the building acts the same and provides a thermally protected unit. The interiors have um, finishes that don't off gas, such as linoleum, natural linoleum, recycled carpet, formaldehyde-free MDF cabinets. Um, we're using super efficient compact refrigerators. Our light fixtures are all compact fluorescent, and the public fixtures are on motion, or the light fixtures in the public areas are on motion sensors. The city of Santa Monica um, has given this project money as well to build a demonstration project in the alley behind the project, uh, which is a series of underground chambers which collect the stormwater runoff from our property and uh, the rest of the block. We're actually the low point on the block. Um, and then lets that water soak back into the ground table rather than go into the sewer system. The project will generate um, most of its own electricity on the site and this raises interesting issues about the future of our reliance on the utility grid. The micro turbine that we have we're only running for six hours a day um, because that's all we really need for the zero uh, utility bill but we could run it for another 12 hours a day and possibly sell energy or give energy to the rest of the block or the bus yard across the alley. Next. There's another slide on the other side also. I just want to um, conclude by saying that every second three people are born on this planet, two of them in cities. Los Angeles is the nation's second biggest city. It's a fact that people are already living here in conditions that the city planning and zoning department would consider illegal. People are not um, housing their two cars inside their required two-car garage. People are renting garage apartments and accessory units. Two and three families are sharing houses in R1 zones. Businesses are being run out of houses zoned R1. And there's not enough available housing. Um, almost no condo or multifamily housing has been built in the last 10 years. And part of that is because um, not a lot of architects will do condo projects anymore because of the liability. Even subcontractors have refused to do condo projects because of that. There needs to be a comprehensive, creative rezoning of the entire city to be able to eliminate obsolete barriers and provide the diversity of housing types we need. Architects have a relevance beyond stylists and critics and can contribute to the plan to reinvent the way we live. Thank you. Thank you, Angie. At this time, I'd like to ask our presenters to come up on stage um, for the last part of the morning session, which is the panel discussion. I'd also like to take this opportunity to introduce Dana Cuff, who will be moderating.
uh, Dana Cuff is professor and vice chair of architecture and urban design at UCLA, where she teaches and studies culture and politics and design. She has published widely about Los Angeles urbanism, architectural practice, the architectural profession, contentious planning debates, digital technology design, and affordable housing. Cuff is the recipient of numerous awards for her work, including a fellowship at the Getty Research Institute. She recently completed a book entitled The Provisional City, which theorizes urban structure as a result of politically charged, large-scale architectural and planning interventions. Well, we've had a morning with a lot of information. Can you hear me? No. We've had a morning with a lot of information, uh, a lot of images. I think the complexity of the housing problem, um, not just in Los Angeles, but in general, is uh, apparent from these various presentations today. And in a way, it points to I think some of our reluctance as architects to get involved at the levels we have to get involved in order to grapple with the actual problems. Um, watching Tom's uh, mastery over data through the various comparative analyses that he makes reminds me of how um, much our powers of vision are needed to understand these kinds of complex problems. Um, I'd just like to raise a couple of questions to the panelists and hear their response. And then I think it would be useful to open it up to the audience. There are probably plenty of people with questions and um, interest in getting responses from the various people who you've heard from this morning. I think this morning we have confounded a number of issues together, actually, that were raised by the broad question the conference raises, and that is beyond sprawl. It seems to me that we've um, placed together sprawl, density, and affordability, almost as if they were equivalents. And one part of my question to you would be how you see those as separate, or if we need to see those as separate, um, and of what value that might be. And the second question I have was really raised, I think, by Angie's last um, project. And that has to do with questions of scale as we think about questions of density, sprawl, and affordability. Um, when we talk about getting 220 units to the acre, but we're only building eight of those, it seems to me the question of scale has to come into play. Because certainly in the Colorado project, there were so many things that were possible to accomplish at the level of sustainability and density that one can't do lot by lot. And so I'd also like to hear your comments on how issues of scale play into your thinking about housing and sprawl and density. I, I, I want to answer the first, the first question that you posed. Um, I think sprawl, density, and affordability are um, completely intertwined. Um, and you can't really talk about one without talking about the other. Um, I just think it's a huge problem that um, we have people who really can't afford to live in adequate housing situations here. Um, and I think it's a complex problem. And I think maybe part of the solution is to have some someone at the city or somewhere do a comprehensive analysis or a comprehensive plan of all of the issues that relate to sprawl and density. Um, for instance, I'd really love to see a picture of a map that's um, an MTA map that shows our transit um, layered on a zoning map, layered on um, another map of population, you know, to see what's really happening because I don't think that has been done yet. Um, for instance, there's a lot of areas along the blue line that are zoned industrial um, where it would be a great place to build a lot of housing, but right now you can't because it's zoned industrial, even though a lot of the industrial lots are not used or there are vacant buildings sitting on them. I just want to mention when I was talking about the home ownership, I forgot to mention one of my points was that um, people use single family homes to accumulate wealth. Uh, particularly in California where you can do nothing and your property values will double and triple over a 10-year period. And 
so when you talk about, and condos don't have the same appreciation unless you happen to be in Brentwood or someplace like that and bought in the 70s. So um, that's another barrier that I see. I mean, the whole economic system is, you know, it's not only that some people are hungry for land um, and for a little piece of their land, it's also that um, that's how you create a, a nest egg and an asset for future generations in your family. And so that's another challenge of, uh, you know, how do you get people into different kinds of housing when they don't see that they're going to have the economic benefits that they get from being in a single family house, which of course encourages the sprawl of uh, people going and farther and farther out to get a house. Uh, another point to add is there, there is in Los Angeles um, a general plan which lays out um, the, the, the macro scale, um, what Angie's talking about, and d did actually spend, uh, there was uh, many years, I think three years or so, to develop this framework um, of the city's general plan, and it, it does actually address um, those very points, and it establishes um, centers, neighborhood centers, different scaled centers up to the downtown, the biggest, and then it has um, corridors of mixed-use um, boulevards and where, where there's lots of capacity. There's, there's so much uh, capacity in the city, in, in, in frankly, appropriate places uh, near transit, and they, and they have overlaid the um, transit and bus routes, and you can do more, you can reduce the parking, you don't have yard requirements, setbacks, all that. And um, to me, the trick is like, how do you effectuate that, all those even relaxed rules or, or regulations? Um, and uh, there's an effort, there's a group um, meeting now um, that I invite you all to participate in, in some way or another, that's um, looking at the barriers to infill housing. And, and to, to me, infill housing is basically all of Los Angeles now because it's built. Um, but, but this group, um, led by Environment Now, uh, is looking at the barriers, whatever they may be, um, codes or otherwise, and um, trying to address uh, the inability to get from the capacity to the actual housing production. Um, I want to second what Angie's uh, comment is, which is that sprawl, density, and affordability are all just one big ball rolled up together. Um, as a developer, you know, there's really very little difference building a 50-unit project as opposed to a 500-unit project in terms of the amount of work that you have to go through and amount of time and effort and heartache that you have to go through. Um, but in an urban area, it is atypical that you would be able to find enough land with the right zoning to build 500 units. So don't do what we do, or at least Community Corporation does, which is build these tiny 44 unit projects. We, as an organization that's focused in building on the west side, really don't have much of a choice because of lack of available land. But we can create more land, we can create more density. And I think that that's why, you know, it always comes back to can we find and visualize good design so that we can sell density to the voters and the neighbors. Um, because density is the answer to sprawl. Density is also indirectly an answer to affordability. Because the more units we build, the more likely that units will be open up to a range of um, economic classes. Um, I really address the uh, matter of scale. Uh, you know, I, I think that there's one thing that I can't reiterate more you know, than um, I try to, which is like just about every other breath. We need to be engaged in the public dialogue about where we want to be as a city and, and, and as a region. Um, in the next 20 years. Uh, Tom mentioned that in his regional analysis, there are 16 million people living in the Southern California region right now, about 4 million of them in the city of Los Angeles. And unless we find a way to engage people to talk about how we're going to grow, we are really heading for disaster. Because the quality of life over, you know, I, I believe has 
that we experience ha has really suffered in the last 20 years. And it's not because there are more people living there, but I do believe that Southern California at, is at the cusp of changing from a suburban built environment to an urban environment. And unless we move towards that direction, we're just going to create more air pollution, more traffic gridlock, um, less affordability, and um, a much more difficult time attracting the talents and growing the talents and keeping the talents to grow our economy here. Um, so being engaged is really important because what happens, every one of you come here because you want to do something positive, you want to be engaged in a constructive dialogue, but I can tell you that every time that we go out to a community meeting to talk about building an affordable housing project in a neighborhood, and we're not talking about building public housing for, for ra as last resort housing for the um, unemployed. We're talking about building affordable housing for working families. Um, people who work in the service industries, whether it's in hotels, restaurants, or retail. Every time we go out to the community, the, just about the only people who show up on their own without an invitation, well, because we invite them to come, just about Without, you know, the people we did not, we didn't recruit to come, all of them are NIMBYs or bananas. And it's, because, why? It's because I think that it's just human nature to get worked up and exercised about something that you don't like. But in order to counteract that destructive force, we have to be engaged and attend these meetings and stand up and say that density is a good thing. Um, I just wanted to respond to what Jan said about the general plan for the city of LA. I actually downloaded it on my computer and read it. And it sounds really good and it makes it sound like Los Angeles is a great place to live with all these compact centers and everything. And then when you go down to the city planning office with a real project and you point out that it's in one of these areas, I have had a planner actually tell me, nobody reads the general plan. You know, why even bother looking at that? <laughs> and I mean, I think we can talk about things on a, on a larger scale, but when you really get down to it, there's, if there's no communication between the building department and the planning department or the planners and the general plan, um, you know, it's really hard to get things done. One of the issues that I think is apparent is that, and Jane, you talked about three problems to in, uh, increasing density and providing housing. I think it was politics, funding, and codes or regulations. I think that there, there's a fourth one that you allude to, and I'd like to expand upon that just for our purposes as architects, and that is the lack of a kind of vision with initiative, <laughs> not just an abil ability to visualize what's already been determined somewhere else. I think it's extremely important and complicated for architects to get involved at that level because it means that you have to master finance, politics, and legislative elements before you get to the design component. But if we don't do that, we become translators and illustrators rather than full-blown participants in that you know, much more central and crucial process. Um, I think that's basically what Jane's asking for in terms of involvement at the city level and ability to envision possible futures that otherwise remain at the level of general plans and aren't really embodied in any sense. Um. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, I can commit on behalf of everybody in the city, I'll be so bold, to say that if there are codes, if there are um, regulations that um, preclude creative architecture or, crea or creative ways to um, produce density, you should, t you should bring them to us, we'll write the code, we'll change the codes, or we'll try to change the codes. I think there's a real political will right now, um, which is different than it has been in the past. There's a city planning commission that wants to build housing, there's uh, a mayor that wants to build housing, and there are council members who want to build housing. So I think it's different right now, and should you bring those things to us, I think they can um, become realities. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, we're at the very, this is the very nitty-gritty level, you know, show us code sections, we'll change them, you know, 
and I, I think that that's something you can really help with as architects. Are there questions that uh, you have in the audience? Charlene? Could you speak up? I'm sure that people can hear. Can you hear in the back? Not at all. Uh, let me reframe the comment, or, and maybe we'll ask people if you're not too intimidated to stand up when you make your comment or ask your question. Uh, the comment was, isn't it time that uh, with the improvements in public transportation and the cost of owning a car that we actually carefully plan transit-oriented centers? Is that correct, Charlene? where no cars are necessary. And, and were you, was there a question that or just a comment that? Uh, is this a realistic goal? I think um, in, uh, somebody pointed out, I think um, uh, Angie, to, um, the downtown Tom Gilmore buildings, he's built several, um, where you don't have to build any parking. That's adaptive re reuse, where you're reusing commercial and to residential, and right now we're trying to, that only applies in the downtown right now, and there's um, uh, ordinances going through the city to expand that to Hollywood, the other side of the freeway, and Wilshire, different places, so there's the chance to do that. Um, the other answer is that the, you, the parking codes are reduced near transit to something like a, one car per unit, but nobody's wanted to go to nothing, and in fact, even if you went to nothing, the lenders will not lend money for something like that. They are the ones that make you, sometimes they make you do more than the city. So, well, you, you ask why. The question is because the marketability. Now, you may live near transit and you have a job that you can get there, but if you lose that job, the next job you find, you may need a car. Uh, and so I think there's a lack of trust that people can really live middle class people are going to live without cars in the city. There are lots of poor people who live without cars in the city or they share cars actually. Uh, and our density bonus ordinance does provide for a parking reduction for affordable units as part of the density bonus process. You don't even have to get the density bonus. You can just apply for the parking reduction. And we had to prove this to the planning commission. We worked on this for three years in 93 through to 95. We had student intern and staff go out to various affordable housing developments in Pico Union and Westlake, which are the densest parts of the city, at five in the morning and take pictures of parking lots to prove that poor people don't have 2.5 cars. Um, so there, that is in the books right now, uh, but again, it's, it's just for um, affordable units, a certain income rate. Uh, Gary has a microphone, so if you just want to take it. Well, I think that the...
I think I agree with you to a certain extent that um, lenders and builders are critical players and we'd be benefiting by hearing from them as well. But I disagree that they're the ones who are going to be making the changes. Because I think we've seen for a long time, and I'd be interested in hearing your points about this as well, that those are probably the most conservative, least risk-taking players in the overall building process. And any reliance on them has basically led to what we see now. What's interesting to me about the panel that's been constructed here today, I don't include myself in that, um, is that these people are actually doing something outside of the standard market provision of housing. And that may be one of the ways to save a, a, an idea of density and affordability within the city. And it may also be a way for architects to begin to innovate and um, provide the initiative and vision that we need to have before builders and lenders will come along with us. I'm just going to let them answer the, to that same issue. If we are putting together something, should we meet the year from now? Should we submit the relationship with the builder and the architect, designer, planner, or whatever? Then we can, I think that might be something interesting to consider. That's a good idea. Um, we work with a lot of lenders, and um, Lenders work in a, na on a national and international environment. And frankly, they send their money where they think it's the safest. So it is for us to live in a, so their choices are much more one where they go around and pick what they feel are the safest, you know, safest projects to invest in. Our job as local citizens and communities that are geographically located here is to really create that environment so that the lenders and investors can feel comfortable coming in to um, invest their money. The same is true for these large national lenders. We agree um, that unless all the national large builders are involved in coming back into LA to invest in LA and building densely, um, there's no no amount of code changing is going to make much of a difference. The purpose of engaging a city to change the code is to create a business environment where these national builders can come back and build in LA and build densely with less cars in the garage. Um, but again, these national builders and international builders like Trammell Crow, like Forest City, like Kaufman and Broad, they the, the world is their stage. They're not interested in staying, remaining, or coming back into an LA where building is, a, is, you know, where they have to face a hostile environment for the building. They don't need to. They can build somewhere else. Um, so again, local action by local citizens is what it, it's going to be what it takes to improve our own quality of life. We have another question here. I'd like to also add to that that I think politicians are probably more relevant to the to the problem than builders or lenders because if the local city council person doesn't like what you're doing, even if you're doing it by right, you're not going to get it done. Hello, and thank you. Um, my name's Tom Gilmore. I did want to clear up one quick thing. We do have parking at the Old Bank District, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's very affordable. Uh, the, the, uh, and it's because there's it, no mass transit light rail going by those buildings. It's not bad. It's very close, and although it is a market issue, not a code issue. And I, and I will say that in general, the problem here is really not the city. Uh, the, the city is, seems to be doing everything it possibly can do to make it easier to do higher density housing, and, and I think has been pretty successful in it lately. I think that the big issue is the one uh, you're talking about right now, uh, which is economics and the inability to get large lenders, large conventional lenders involved in this process. And, and I think that leads to my question, which is I'm a great advocate of mixed income affordable housing. Our next project is going to be one, but I have a great fear of inclusionary zoning because I actually think that while the intent of inclusionary zoning is, is an excellent intent, what it effectively does is, is add yet another layer of 
of inability for large lenders and large uh, building and construction companies to invest in the very areas that need mixed income affordable housing because what it does do is limit your ability to do market rate housing instead of incentivizing your ability to do mixed income housing. So uh, yeah, I'll take any comment from anybody on that. Um, mixed income housing is very, very frequently done by developers um, who look at the e economics. For example, without any local inclusionary housing requirements, the state gives you a 25% density bonus for setting aside 20% of the, any development project for affordable housing. So you do get a substantial economic incentive in the way of a larger, build, you know, a larger number of units that you are otherwise able to build by including affordable housing in your project. And what we're exploring now, um, I'm on a citizens committee um, um, in the city, ex we're, what we're exploring um, right now in terms of inclusionary in, in the city of LA is working with the Building Industries Association, working with a number of developers to look at what kind of incentives, zoning and planning incentives um, have to be given to require a certain percentage of these units to be set aside for low-income housing. So it becomes a positive incentive for developers rather than a um, negative incentive for a developer. Yeah, I think also what the, when, the, when it gets to the city council, what they're gonna be looking at is just that very question, does it do more harm than good or not? And if it, and, and same with the building industry participants, there's, I mean, their whole point in this, in their participation is, um, we can do it if there's enough on the um, on the high end to uh, pay for the set asides. If not, they're not going to do it. The the density bonuses that are available, pe you, you know, few people take advantage of them. They're not they're not done by everybody, so they're not obviously enough of an incentive where it's where everybody's just doing that. So, if I mean, housing is a business. If it doesn't pencil out, we're either going to have no housing at all and an inclusionary requirement or something that works and we get both. So I, I think in the end, at the city council, there's only gonna be eight votes if uh, things pencil out. Uh, I'm supervising the study of inclusionary housing by a consultant right now. Our department is doing that. And part of the task is to quantify the value of incentives that the city can provide, such as requiring various fees to be paid when the permits are pulled rather than at plan check. I don't, I'm not a developer, so I don't know how many months, but you can certainly say there's an economic value to that. But we're doing, or the consultant is, is, is looking very hard at what are the actual economic values. And the development community rightfully has suspicions that the city can't deliver on some of these in terms of reducing time of processing and so forth. I've had a, a number of developers call me over the past couple years tearing their hair out because they don't want to wait two years to get a permanent tract map for their condo development and they're really sorry they own land in the city. So clearly the city needs to do a better job at, at a number of levels and that's the thing about affordable housing and, and all of housing. It's, there's no magic bullet. There are many, many ways to get to more units to house people who live here. There's not just one path. There's need for more money. There's need for better processing. There's need for more creative developers, such as uh, yourself, uh, Mr. Gilmore, and, and others to take advantage and be entrepreneurial and to work with us. Uh, one thing we're doing with the Downtown Rebound Planning Grant that we got from the state is to capture and put down on paper the innovations that Tom Gilmore uh, did with his adaptive reuse so that the next developer who wants to come doesn't have to reinvent the wheel with the fire department and the planning and building and safety departments, what actually flexibilities do they find in the codes? What creative solutions do they come up? And we're going to create a handbook so that other developers, even people outside of the city, can say, oh, gee, I can buy a, an old office building that has no productive uses in the future as an office building and turn it into housing and here's here's a path that I can go through because other people blaze the trail. So there's a lot of different things we need to do to kind of smooth the path and, and the lending community definitely needs to come along too, but, but as 
Joan said, they're, they're the cautious ones and they have to be shown there's a market. Um, so, and that's what we're looking at too. What is the market for housing downtown? Downtown has a potential of providing up to 20,000 units of housing. It could, it could be a huge, huge uh, growth over the next couple of years. So there's a real resource there that needs to be tapped in creative ways that also have good design. Because the first time we start increasing density and it's an ugly building, you know what's going to happen. It's going to become the poster child for why we can't let this happen anywhere else in the city. I think, though, one of the things that, in recognizing that sprawl has hit the wall, as Michael Deere at the Southern California Studies Center puts it, regulation has hit the wall as well. And perhaps it's our need to build more creatively that's made that so apparent. Uh, I mean, there, there's going to have to be as creative a thinking in the way we look at our zoning and codes and regulations as there is at every other part of the housing process, or we're not going to be able to do what needs to be done. Uh, yeah, how about here? Um, I'd like to just uh, bring add it closer. In. Hmm? We still can't hear you. Just bring it closer. I'd like to add to the three concepts that you linked, which is uh, density, sprawl, and, and affordability, um, or sustainability, and quality of life. <clears throat> they have been touched on by some of the speakers, but I just want to emphasize that for the long term, truly long term success of any of these innovations to accommodate higher population successfully, uh, we do have to make them both sustainable and uh, 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 conducive to a quality of life that truly enhances people's uh, well-being. And included in that sustainability is something that very few groups or individuals are dealing with, which is <clears throat> food security, urban food security. And maybe it's too complicated to start talking about right now, but, it, but for designers and planners, I think uh, that really is an essential element to be included in, in planning. Is there another comment? Oh, could I just say that uh, the food security means that people have the money to buy food and, and and not starve, basically. And, and, and affordable housing, the reason there's a need for it is because housing cost is the biggest single item in most people's budgets. So when you have housing that isn't taking 60 or 70 percent of your pre-tax income, you have you know, money to actually buy the medicine and the food and pay for the doctors and the transportation and all the other things. That's why it's so critical uh, that people don't have the money to, um, to survive in all the aspects of life. I'd also like to add to that and add um, infrastructure to that because I know there are parts of LA that are zoned for a lot of units but you can't put more than um, two single family houses on the lot because the sewer system is only six inches and it hasn't been replaced in 70 years or something. I don't know. I know the city of LA has plans for upgrading a lot of their infrastructure but I don't know if it's tied to zoning. Um, or if there's any studies about development in those areas. I agree with you that uh, quality of life is really the basic issue and sustainability is a necessity for that. Um, my question, I think, did um, want to deal more with some of the, the background issues, things that make an environment more attractive or attractive again. And uh, so perhaps you'd like to to comment uh, more in that area uh, concerning uh, the role of urban open space and other design tasks for neighborhood community. The role of open space and what was the second one? Uh, other design tasks that deal with um, neighborhood community. 
So you're right? talking now about if, if what this is beyond sprawl, we have to also rethink the other elements of urban structure, whether that's well, not just housing, but open space, infrastructure, community services. Yes, and I think it can be at all scales uh, from the terrace at um, Colorado Court to be begin to provide a secure place, but a social place, uh, and thinking about different age groups that have to be accommodated uh, in their overall orbit of the day, and their routines and, and where they interact. Uh, certainly talking about those parking lots that, that are going unused in some urban neighborhoods and the potential to utilize them for, for food or for essentially for education uh, by interaction between different generations within a neighborhood. Uh, the, uh, these are some of the kinds of things that I think could attract people to live in higher density uh, when they can't get from one suburban area to another. Um, this, is, this is all very interesting. I think that the discussion in the last couple of hours really led me to, it led to this uh, basic um, you know, issue, which is you know, how do we choose to live our lives, whether it's um, becoming less dependent on cars, um, and the expression of that in the built environment is, you know, building less garages. Or how do we choose to, you know, uh, conduct ourselves, our social interaction, the question about open space. Um, in Santa Monica, the discussion about open space is getting to a fevered pitch right now. And um, the lessons that I've learned from it is that it's primarily a matter of lifestyle choices. For example, um, should open space be passive open space or active open space? Should we have pocket parks or should we have ball fields? I remember that 20 years ago, there was already a problem reserving you know, soccer fields for practice or for games in Santa Monica. Today, that has become a crisis. Now, um, the question you know, that, that comes to mind is that, yeah, you know, 20 years ago, you know, we maybe we have enough fields to, barely have enough fields to accommodate the soccer teams for practice and for games. Um, now we just plain don't. Th then is soccer really the issue or is it, you know, the ability to um, give young people or, you know, older people um, the space to exercise and to have so social interaction in an active setting? Can we have beach volleyball rather than soccer? You know, because you know, in the end, the choice is: Do we want to? Can we change our lifestyles? And in, you know, it's not, not having soccer field is not necessarily a reduction in the quality of life. The question really is: Are there other comparable, alternative means of um, allowing those social interactions, and um, you know, in an active setting? And I would suggest that, at least in, 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 in my view, that there are some of these lifestyle choices that could be changed in order to accommodate the fact that we're growing into you know, a, a region of 16 million people now and 25 million people in, I believe, 20 years. Well, I think having open space makes um, tighter, smaller housing units easier to tolerate. We certainly have the weather to be outdoors a lot, but we don't have always the spaces to go. When you look at, I lived in Denmark for two and a half years, and everybody lives mostly in small flats, but you have beautiful environments to walk in. You're out in the country within 10 or 15 minutes out of most of their cities. So what, what we don't have is the kind of the refreshment um, that you get from being out in nature. I think uh, Tom talked about the privatization of open space in people's backyards. Well, that's nice for people who have them. But what about all the families growing up in apartments that don't have any place for their kids to play, as opposed to the community corp buildings where there was low density and there was green space around the unit so the kids can play outside? We'll take one more question. even on architectural review boards.
We welcome your participation. We urge you to participate. We can talk to you afterwards. There's just a million ways, depending on what, you know, you, how you want to do it, for you to really have meaningful participation. So maybe it's better to just talk to you afterwards. Uh, Michael Porras, I'm an architect in Detroit. I graduated from SciArc. It's kind of a perfect segue into what I was going to uh, talk about because actually my practice in Detroit were very involved in uh, zoning. Most, many of the projects we're doing, we've actually gone and chain zoning. We're doing chain zoning. Um, and it's actually that uh, interactive, that, that uh, sort of involvement at the government level that's helping to make projects happen. And truthfully, much of the zoning, when you go and read the zoning, it says, oh, it only allows four units per acre. Well, you know, you go to the city, you start to say, well, we want to do something that has 30 units per acre, and here's why. And honestly, we, you can change the zoning, and it's up to us as architects to actually take that role on and go through the 1,500 pages and come up with the solution. And right now, um, I have 100 units of housing, low-income housing, under construction in a neighborhood that hadn't had a building permit pulled in 30 years. Um, and there's another 100 coming. Um, and that area was actually zoned. Uh, there were 50 people living in that neighborhood. Um, it was zoned uh, light industrial. And we got the city to change it to residential. And we're doing that. And the other thing is, as far as funding, you could not get a bank to give funding. There's five funding sources for that project. Now that that project's under construction in there, the banks are willing to give loans in that area. And now there's lofts being developed. There's all sorts of other things. Um, in another community in Utica, we're doing 350 units of townhouses. And those, it's, again, that was zoned as garden apartments, four units per acre. So we went to the city and said, we'd like to do something denser. We're doing 20 units per acre. And um, it's, an, it's, an, it's an area that actually is mostly single family houses. This provides uh, an opportunity for handicapped people, for uh, empty nesters, for young couples, for singles. It's a housing alternative. And in that same community, there was, there was, they, were, they had their old zoning. No one had come to them to question it. So us as architects with the developer went to them and said, OK, let's do something. In another area in Birmingham, we've gotten a light industrial area change to uh, mixed use um, and we're doing live work units townhouses um, and also some of the light industrial buildings can now be changed and be residential and i think but the point is we as architects truthfully we gave up that role um, we've 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 focused on on style and and not on these issues and if you look back at modernism at Mies and you know, they had housing, they had social agendas, and I think that's something that we can take back. Thank you. Well, my question to you is, do you, is that something you agree with? I mean, is that? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, that's great, and I think architects traditionally aren't proactive people, um, and I think part of the reason is that our education is not set up to teach people to be that way. Um, yeah, but I guess I would add to that that, uh, you know, the last time we had a wave of housing in, among architects, architecture schools, and as a profession was when the federal government had a lot of money behind housing, or there were various kinds of tax incentives, and those just haven't existed since Reagan or before that. We perhaps are at a new kind of confluence of events, whether it is that, you know, the commutes are actually too long to live in Palm Springs adjacent and work in Los Angeles. That, in fact, you, you know, there are one too many suburbans on the road. That, you know, there a, a variety of factors presents all of us in politics, in architecture, in nonprofit housing the opportunity now to do something differently than we would have done 20 years ago. So I think that what's inspiring to me about this is that it's not a matter of um, individual incentive. We've been trying that for the 20 years intervening. The possibility now is that something larger may transpire that um, has to do with this confluence of factors 
and sets up a new generation of housing and housing solutions. Good place to conclude the morning session. Um, I'd like to thank all of the participants. And thank you all for attending. Uh, I'd also like to invite you back this afternoon. Um, we're going to reconvene at 2 o'clock. Um, with Dana Cuff, who will be giving a talk, Dreams of Home, the End of Utopia. Um, immediately following that, there will be a series of four presentations of projects, prototypes um, on multi-unit family dwelling, medium and high density by Michael Bell, Albert Pope, Mark Mack, and Marcelo Spina. Uh, immediately follow, there will be another um, panel discussion hosted or moderated by Robert Somel. And finally, um, Roger Sherman is going to offer some uh, concluding remarks by way of summary. Okay. Hope to see you back here at 2. Thank you. Okay. We're about to get started, can I ask you to grab a seat? No? I think so. There's new people. There's new people. Okay, I'd like to welcome those of you that attended the morning session back um, to this conference on housing hosted by SciArc. Um, those of you coming for the afternoon, my name is Gary Page, a member of the design faculty, and I'd like to welcome you to SciArc. Uh, before we begin, I just want to say a word about the format. Um, our first speaker is going to be Dana Cuff, who's going to be giving a talk titled, well, the title was up there, The um, Dreams of Home, the End of Utopia. Uh, immediately following that, from 2.45 to 4.35, there'll be a presentation of projects um, by four architects, Michael Bell, Albert Pope, Mark Mack, Marcelo Spina. Uh, and following that, we'll have a panel discussion similar to what we did in the morning session, um, this time hosted by, uh, or moderated by Robert Solmel. Um, concluding summary and remarks will be made by my colleague Roger Sherman. Uh, Dana Cuff is a professor and vice chair of architecture and urban design at UCLA, where she teaches and studies culture and politics and design. She has published widely about Los Angeles urbanism, architectural practice, the architectural profession, contentious planning debates, digital technology, and affordable housing. Cuff is the recipient of numerous awards for this work, including a fellowship at the Getty Research Center. She recently completed a book entitled The Provisional City, which theorizes urban structure as a result of politically charged large-scale architecture planning urban interventions. Dr. Cuff is also a principal of a consulting firm, Community Design Associates, specializing in program and neighborhood planning. Please welcome Dana Cuff. Um, for the last, this is kind of a conceptual interlude, I think, between the morning's discussion of politics and policy and the afternoon's discussion of architecture. Uh, I hope it's relevant on both sides of the day. 
For the last three or four years, I've been thinking about the relationship, a relationship that's occupied plenty of philosophers' minds, between utopia and ideology. And as I worked on the Provisional City book, I realized that many of those same questions would be pertinent to the architect. And uh, this talk today is my preliminary thoughts about the relationship between thoughts of utopia, sprawl, and ideology. In his book called The End of Utopia, the historian Russell Jacobi argues that the demise of radicalism has affected us all. That it's basically, uh, we, we live in an era of uh, diminishing um, optimism and increasing cynicism. It's a story we hear a lot. Is there a lot of reverberation in this microphone? Terrible. If I stand back a little bit, is it better? Okay. Um, what Jacobi finds in this period since um, basically the fall of communism <laughs> is that uh, we live in a world where, quote, this society is imagined to be the only possible one. With that, a kind of market mentality governs something like the provision of housing, which basically rests on the most conservative of foundations. Gary, is there any kind of light I could get up at this podium? If not, I can... Oh, it's very purple. Well, uh, okay, that's, that's good, that's good. Um, <laughs> um, utopian thought, it's kind of a throwback to even raise questions of utopia in architecture today. And I do so with a fair amount of trepidation. Um, so you have to bear with me and see if we don't get to a place that overcomes the problems that utopian thinking has proven to embody uh, in the last century. I do believe, though, that utopian thinking plays a central role in imagining a better world by offering radical alternatives to present conditions. From an architectural standpoint, the domestic space of utopian thought, housing, has been one of the most thoroughly considered. And I want to briefly remind you of some of the highlights, it's sort of the 15 minutes of utopian thinking for the last 100 years um, history survey. Uh, <laughs> I'll be brief. There's no test. Um, well, Garden Cities, uh, Ebenezer Howard's proposal at the turn of the 19th century was um, probably one of the best defined utopian thought, uh, utopian proposals. It merged paradise with civilization, nature and the city. And what I want to do is demonstrate to you that there are certain themes that come from utopian thinking in the last hundred years, and that indeed these themes are ones which govern our thinking about housing today. Commonly held property in the Garden City would be nationalized. You owned only what you produced. Um, this was going to be a remedy to the capitalist oppression. Um, not with no work, there was, it was not a society of leisure, but with what Howard called true work, work that was meaningful, um, work that was completed in a condition of cooperative organization. This was really a reaction against industrialists. Housing was to be clustered in relationship to agriculture and open space. And so in a sense, one of the themes that we'll see is the recurrence of this connection between civilization and nature and the role that an image of paradise plays as a part of that. Uh, maybe six years later, in 1904, Tony Garnier showed his Ecole de Beaux-Arts scheme, the Cité Industrielle. Um, his proposal, which was totally rejected by the Academy, was a reaction to the lack of planning and organization of the 19th century city. He's one of the first to propose a heavily zoned organization of a utopian urbanism 
three zones, unlike Siam's later four, Garnier had administrative, industrial, and residential for 33,000 inhabitants who would be living in both industrial conditions and beautiful conditions. And Garnier saw his task as demonstrating that the modern world of industrial production could be aesthetically pleasing as well. His scheme is dependent in some regards on an abundance of power and on the technology of industry. And we'll see that abundance is another one of these themes that um, is a kind of point of origin for utopian thought. His housing, um, as shown in this image, is industrially produced concrete structures um, with this kind of draping garden surrounding them, public gardens. Obviously, you can't talk about the history of utopian thought without touching upon Broadacre City, which um, frankly Wright showed at Rockefeller Center, actually, in 1935. He first showed the model there. This decentralized society was a reduction of density of existing cities to, obviously, one acre per household. His notion was the classic American one, that morality and landed property went together, democracy based on individualism, which was rooted to the land and working on the land. So the people who would live in Broadacre City were to farm their own land, which they would sell basically at farmer's markets, the produce that they um, harvested, while at the same time working at nearby factories. And in this sense, it was a, a merger of civilization and nature, agriculture together, completely enabled by the car, along with other transportation technologies. Um, and of course, it's Wright's notion that the technology of modern transpor transportation made urban concentrations density unnecessary. By so doing, then we would have independence and individual freedom. And of course, that's one of the other themes that comes out from utopian thought, is the relationship between individual freedom and authority. The abundance that Wright depended on, of course, was the abundance only available in the American landscape, that of land itself. Corbus Ville Contemporain, just selecting one of his many utopian proposals, this one from 1922 arose basically out of the political unrest that was going across Europe, fresh on the heels of the Russian Revolution. And the question of um, conditions and context in which utopian thinking originates is fundamental to the proposals of a radical future. Um, Korb believed that people's fundamental need for shelter had been unmet by the traditional city and that by making the city into a machine, a, we could protect ourselves, in fact, against nature through a more efficient and more functional environment. Efficiency and speed were brought about by good zoning, good planning, and high technology. Here, density is of the essence. Um, the high rise and the multiple high rises that he proposed were to adapt to family life by opening more ground for gardens, roofs for recreation, and a separation of high-speed traffic from uh, pedestrian activity. The density in this case was to make the good life possible in contrast to uh, existing European cities, which were less dense and less livable. Um, these gardens in the air, again, I think are an interesting manifestation of this continuing connection between the place of residence and nature. Lastly, I would just mention um, one of the megastructure proposals by Archigram, the most well-known of all probably, Plug-in City. The economy uh, in England and America was strong enough in the 60s that um, abundance seemed like a problem. What were we going to do with all the leisure time that had been uh, produced by this uh, blossoming, strong uh, economic condition? The solution that came from Archigram, among others, was that designers and scientists 
through technology could make the new city a city where the artificial would indeed outstrip the natural and be far better. The superstructure in these megastructural proposals, like uh, the one you see in the upper left, was to organize the city services and infrastructure. The residential component then would be a clip-on, flexible, short-term um, infill item. Indeed, consumer choice was really the idea of individual freedom, a classic response um, to economic prosperity was that we would basically choose our houses like we chose our morning cereal. So you could clip in with this permanently built-in crane the house of your present desires, which through planned obsolescence you could get rid of and gather another. Um, on the right, if you're not familiar with this image, those are mobile offices. Instead of having to drive to and from your office, your office drove to you. What these different utopian proposals have in common are certain constructs that recur seemingly in all utopian thought or all thought of a better world. I think these constructs may have some implications for scale and density of housing, um, the kinds of issues that we're considering here today. At least the position that the uh, architect assumes on these different issues will affect and influence an attitude towards density. So the first one has to do with the bonds between nature or paradise and civilization and the city. Um, Garden City, for example, more nature meant less density. The second is the balance of work and leisure, which recurs consistently, that uh, has led in some cases to a concentration of housing near work or in the city so that that enables greater time for leisure activity. Uh, a third is technology's enabling powers. The automobile sets us free, or perhaps as we think now becomes our prison. Um, the technology of contemporary science could do better than nature itself in the proposals from the 1960s so that the artificial would take over uh, and leave natural resources to um, their own natural domain. A fourth is the uh, initial condition of abundance that's a necessary precondition either of land and thus producing a solution of low density of hydroelectric power in the case of the Cité Industrielle um, or of time and leisure which led for instance in the megastructure proposals to think about free time nodes like Ron Heron's proposals in the Oasis project. Those are dense centers where with all that free time we'll be able to hang out with each other and have a better life. Private versus common property is one that we actually spoke about a little bit this morning. Um, the questions of ownership are fundamental to any kind of utopian proposal or thought about restructuring existing conditions. Um, private ownership tends to lead towards decentralization and to the distribution of density, whereas the, an emphasis on the shared nature of common property tends to lead to solutions urban formations that are centralized and uh, exhibit higher density. Flexibility and choice has to do with individual freedoms and that typically is played out in the residential domain. That's where the options that are available allow the utopianists to express their individuality or um, alter what's given um, or are otherwise, as we often accuse modernist utopian proposals, of doing, um, conscribing the individual to a uh, anonymous identity and an inflexible set of choices. The idea of a transformative individualism is uh, part of that notion of flexibility and choice. The individual freedoms that we have in daily life are part of how we um, change as individuals. I think Joan Ling brought that up at the end of the morning's conversation. It's choices about how we want to live. Questions of morality, self-expression um, are all part of uh, how we have to think about housing, which expand it to this complex set of questions. Um, 
The last two are probably the ones that are most important. Um, the critique of the contemporary order is what is often called the utopian paradox. And that is that uh, one can't formulate radical propositions of the future without basing them on the critique of the present, which means inherently that the future is always tied to what present exists or what has existed in the past and therefore cannot be as radical as it projects itself to be. This I think is really critical in thinking about what we do with the suburbs, how we go beyond sprawl. It's tied to the idea that utopias are perhaps the fundamental way that we can take a critical stance on ideology and this comes from the uh, philosopher Mannheim who suggests that the only way to step outside idea, a dominant ideological structure is by, by proposing an entirely other world, a utopia, from which you can then take a point of view upon present conditions. I clearly talked too long about that slide. Uh, well, okay, so much for these um, theoretical proposals, how have these played out in the residential environment? How, how have the constructs of a better world manifested themselves in 20th century housing? Clarence Stein and Henry Wright's Sunnyside Gardens and Village Green um, put twice the density, more or less, that suburban housing uh, demonstrated at the time. And I think from these images, you can see that the a uh, garden clearly dominates the idea of the domestic. Um, and at the, along with the garden dominating, leisure dominates. We, the, the person in the chair sitting in the sun reading is part of the vision of that better world that the housing of um, Village Green and Sunnyside Gardens projected. Another place where clear utopian thought was part of the originating model is in uh, public housing across the United States in the 30s and 40s. Uh, here I'm just showing a typical, in some sense, garden apartment version of public housing. This is Elisa Village in downtown Los Angeles, as many of you know, I'm sure recently demolished. Um, it's interesting because I think of it, it is very much based on a critique of existing orders, that cr existing order being the neighborhood you see on the upper left, classified as a slum, a privately held property, individually organized on lots, was all demolished um, systematically in order to provide a common <laughs> and collective, indeed socialistic, model of a better world, which public housing definitely represented. It was going to be higher density. Uh, the collective was going to protect our individual freedoms. That's the kind of ideological background underpinning um, public housing and, in fact, you know, leading to its demise during the McCarthy era. The garden apartments of public housing were um, balanced in other parts of the public housing agenda with uh, towers in the park. These are um, the Elysian Park Towers, a scheme for Chavez Ravine before Dodger Stadium was built um, by Neutra and Alexander in the late 40s and early 50s. It was uh, thought through as a comprehensive plan of schools, streets, community centers, grocery stores, churches, um, to offer planning as a kind of technique for solving the problems of the city and the making of a better world. Um, within Chavez Ravine, or the Elysian Park scheme, individual freedom would be expressed through choice of housing options that range from these uh, garden apartments on the lower image to the towers to a variety of kinds of apartments. In, in fact, it's the first accessible apartments that I've seen in any um, housing proposals were in Elysian Park, among many options for different kinds of households. And the uh, entire proposal of 3,400 units was a set of choices, basically, that laid out a new city. Uh, Tom Hines has said it's Neutra's closest um, project manifesting his Rush City reform 
um, utopian thinking. Well, another model of the better world, of course, is the one which took over the uh, urban, suburban landscape. This happens to be Westchester, but it could be Levittown or any of a number of post-war housing developments. Here are the positions taken on those uh, constructs of utopia are that private ownership dominates. I would say indeed that what we think of as the garden being important was incidental to the fact that ownership was key. Um, comprehensive plans uh, were not the critical part of thinking about uh, subdivision development. It was instead home ownership for the entire middle class. It was a social policy that we'd get better life through consumer choice of a limited set of models. Like the Broadacre City proposal, the technology of the car would enable the separation of work and leisure so that one could come home to a place of repose and leave the wife and children there to go back to the male-dominated centers for work. Um, in terms of technology, I think the suburbs had a mixed strategy. Uh, it was both high-tech and low-tech. There were high-tech aspects of housing production brought along with the most common aspects of craftsmanship that were available at the time. Um, as I was thinking about this in the time after writing The Provisional City, I realized that the modern equivalents of Westchester were somehow instructive. I've been fixated actually, as many of my students will tell you, on places like celebration. And um, I've been trying to figure out why these new forms of subdivision development uh, take the shape that they do and are as provocative as they are. And I think that the thinking about them in relationship to constructs of utopian thought is indeed instructive. They may be what Russell Jacobi would call just slight improvements on an existing model. But it seems to me they are indeed perversions of that existing model, and that in that, they offer a little bit of hope. Um, and I don't mean in any specific sense. I only mean that by taking the opposite side of a proposal of a better world, we can at least see within them a critique of the existing conditions, which would enable those of us who want to make change to respond on the other side of that continuum. Let me see if I can be more clear about that. So of course, the starting point for these perversions, in my mind, is seaside. A reduced dependence on technology, again going back to this question of the automobile's role. Higher density was uh, proposed in order to gain pedestrian possibilities. We were going to reestablish something like the community of leisure, because in fact, all you needed to do in a place like seaside was walk. You just walk to shopping, indeed. Shopping was leisure, shopping is pleasure, and Cool House has brought to mind that shopping is everything these days. So Seaside, I think, was the idea of the town converted into this uh, consumption model of utopia. That got taken to a degree that I would never have predicted in celebration, the Disney-backed uh, suburban development in Florida which is based on the same principles as Seaside, plus a few extras. I would argue that it's a reaction to the existing conditions of a kind of fearfulness about the city, um, a fearfulness about immigration, about crime, about uncertainties, so that in order to overcome that fear, we could just leave it to the corporation, that corporation being Disney. We can indeed buy a little piece of the happiest place on earth. Um, again, you see leisure being portrayed, not unlike the Sunnyside Gardens image on the right. So uh, in this world, indeed, we are not only separated from work, we don't even need to worry about politics. Why argue when Disney can make the decisions for us? There's no um, need for community politics. There's no possibility for community politics, in fact. It's part of your... Um, covenants, codes, and restrictions that decisions are made entirely by the company. 
calls into question fundamentally what a neighborhood and a community is, and in that regard, I think, makes us question what it is that people think is an ideal of change um, in the current circumstance. If we had to look for the um, initial condition of abundance, it seems to me that the only abundance in a place like Celebration are the, is the financial resources that are needed to gain entry, and that is indeed part of what keeps it so secure. Okay, well those seem normal to me by comparison to a couple of others that I just want to briefly show you now. Um, this one is Harmony, Florida. This is an intentional community, not unlike other kinds of utopias, where you buy a sense of community through something that might be called a lifestyle suburb or a uh, identitopia. I need Bob Somal to give this a name. <laughs> um, uh, in this particular one, Harmony, animal rights dominate. You move into this neighborhood because you want to have a particular relationship to the animals in the world around you and those in your household. Cats can be on leashes. Uh, because the birds have rights, alligators have rights, so your dog is in danger, but that's part of the living. There's a pony therapy, I'm not sure what the cow's about. Um, and all of this is proposed, and I shouldn't be too facetious or cynical about it, as a kind of environmentalist or green proposal at the same time, where um, you actually make a consumer choice if we could ignore the golf course, it would be much more coherent as a consumer choice to support environmentalist positions. Um, now, one of the things that strikes me about this, besides the fact that we use uh, housing purchases like bumper stickers almost in this case, is that the architecture has actually nothing to do with it. And you can see from the images that this, this is not an architecture that responds to animal rights, if that was what your identity was intended to be. Who knows what that might mean, but the architecture is the same architecture that we could find in any of the other developments, even Agritopia here in Arizona, where um, organic farming is the bumper sticker of choice. And this area, which had been farming, is now, I think with very good intentions, hoped to be retained to some extent while development happens. These are not isolated examples. This is a form of development now that I think is an increasingly common one and for interesting reasons, reasons that can't be totally ignored. Um, there is a kind of uh, <laughs> seemingly perverse explanation of these that I find in Thomas Kincaid's work. Um, <laughs> You perhaps got this in your newspaper this morning as well, though this was from my issue last week, which we get weekly, of the marketing of aesthetics and a vision of another life that I think Thomas Kincaid and all of his uh, painter of light um, I, marketing is about. This to me is the utopian dream demonstrates that the utopian dream as played out in suburbia has failed. Here we see the suburban house taken over by trolls, um, that somehow what we need is something even more remote, something even more gothic, something even more isolated, but safe, that somehow Disney met the wilderness and that was what we were going to put forward as our models of some kind of ideal. Now, if you agree with me that clearly this, even if we wanted this, um, it would be not achievable under current conditions of resources and urbanism, then I say this same tendency, this same uh, lack of dissatisfaction with the suburbs that Thomas Kincaid so clearly demonstrates um, could lead to a higher density uh, alternative, a more urban condition that is the sort of solution that would um, respond to the same constructs of a better world, but on the other set of the uh, dimensions, on the other extreme. I'm not going to go over this because we've seen lots of data, and I think um, the LA Now project demonstrates it better than any. 
only to say that I agree with Tom, it's not as if we have to go beyond sprawl, sprawl is over. There's no basis for sprawl, there's no space for sprawl, and the economics of sprawl no longer make sense. So instead, we need to come up with some kinds of alternatives to take those existing conditions, um, whether they be the you know, economics or the geography, and determine what a counterproposal, a utopian counterproposal might be. Well, the idea of proposing a utopia today is impossible if we, by utopia we mean some kind of large comprehensive plan. I think that I can, I'd like to establish some position other than Jac Jacobi's though, the sort of pessimist of um, thinking that the future will only be replicated so that we no longer have uh, the ability to think in a utopian fashion any longer. Maybe Adorno's notion is better that indeed we must contemplate all things as they would present themselves from the standpoint of at least redemption. Um, I don't want to suggest these are utopian by any means, but again, like Thomas Kincaid, I see a certain kind of hope in them. Um, this is a Chicago Housing Authority, and I come back to public housing specifically because I think in the American Public Housing Program, the ability to think comprehensively is more possible than in incremental small-scale market housing schemes. Uh, Chicago Housing Authority took this site that you see in the center of the photo um, as a subject of a design competition. I happened to be on the jury, which selected Brian Healy's scheme at the top as the winning scheme and Doug Garofalo's scheme on the bottom for a citation. These proposals, unlike proposals you'll see in downtown Los Angeles, are not suburban in nature, are not new urbanist in nature, and do not follow the seaside model but instead are trying to find a space between the individual plot of land and private ownership and something like a collective order at a scale that's at least the scale of the block. Um, whenever we talk about utopian thinking now, people immediately turn to Cool House. Um, it may be utopian or dystopian, depending on your point of view, but I think that what's going on in Lille, uh, not only by Coolhouse but Jean Nouvel and Portson Park as well, represents a critique of the existing order that a new city form could be built at an immense scale to make a global city where only a rail stop existed before. Coolhouse talks about breeding the culture of congestion and bigness in his uh, new form of urban growth and change. Uh, similarly, MVRDV, uh, though the top scheme isn't housing, I think finds density in nature in new relationships or finds the ability to um, ga gather a kind of individual expression in the housing development at the bottom, which is both related to technology and um, form, but not the form of the individual house, the form of the collective. And these kinds of schemes seem to me sitting somewhere between a suburban model and the modernist utopias or any of the utopian thinking that I presented earlier. Our critique of the existing order is also a critique of its ideological foundations. We can do this in a big way or as an experiment or prototype in a medium to large way, but I would argue that scale is critical in rethinking the notion of density and sprawl. We can, by taking into account the constructs that have guided our thinking about a better world, find an alternative to the suburb, uh, and something that's more than just its densification. Thanks.
we're going to take a, just a brief moment here to uh, change computers and light bulbs. Okay, the next portion of our conference consists of a set of four presentations, uh, each running approximately 15 minutes in duration. The first one will be delivered by Michael Bell. Michael Bell is the principal of Michael Bell Architecture, which was established in 1989, has been based in San Francisco, Houston, and New York. Bell has taught at Berkeley and Rice and is currently director of the housing program at Columbia University where he is an associate professor and co-director of the core studios. Bell's work has received four progressive architecture awards and citations and has been exhibited at the Museum of Modern Art and in the permanent collection of the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. He is the editor of Slow Space, a collection of 23 works on contemporary urbanism and forthcoming 16 houses owning a house in the city, a chronicle of research and design in federal housing policies in the United States. Michael Bell. Thank you. Um, could we have the lights, please? Or, and should I adjust this? I know Dana was pulling back. Is that okay? Uh, first of all, thank you. I'm happy to be here. Uh, I lived in Berkeley and San Francisco for 10 years. Uh, I have a lot of California in me, but at this point I'm going to focus on New York today. Uh, during the last six years, I've worked extensively in the realm of low-income housing, and in particular, two types of low-income housing. Uh, the first is uh, the federal voucher program established in the late, uh, or I should say mid-1990s, a program that provides point-of-sale support for recipients of low-income assistance, families that might have lived in federal housing but now are being encouraged through federal programs to partake in the market rate type of housing or developer housing. The second, and that's the project based in New York City, I'm sorry, in Houston, Texas called 16 Houses. The second project of lower income housing I've been involved with uh, this during the last year and a half, or closer to two actually, is a project in New York City. It's titled Stateless Housing. It's another type of subsidy that attempts to ameliorate the federal government's role in public housing. Instead, it's a point of, not point of uh, sale support to the purchaser, but instead a uh, point of development assistance to the developer in the form of public-private partnerships, land values that are actually being contributed to the development process. Uh, the 16 Houses uh, opened in 1998, late 1998 in Houston in a nonprofit gallery that was based in the Fifth Ward in Houston, Texas, the area we were working on. Uh, it included the work of 16 architects, which I had invited to participate and respond to a body of research that I had assembled that looked at the federal government's role in terms of providing voucher assistance, as I said, to families that might have been involved with renting housing that had been subsidized at the city, state, or federal level. 16 houses began uh, as research, the type of research that Tom Maine showed this morning, and uh, in a similar manner as an attempt to interpret the research data, not leave it um, as something that was staggering because it's very easy, in fact, I think to find staggering research, it's what we do with it afterwards, which I think Tom spoke to. Uh, in the case of 16 houses, the, uh, the work began by looking at the federal government's plan to distribute as many as 98,000 vouchers that they funded in 1998 for down payment assistance to lower income families. In Houston, through a process of block grants to nonprofits, it was projected that the city would receive as many as 25,000 down payment vouchers. As an architect uh, who had been involved primarily with abstraction, uh, painting, pictorial space, ideas of plasticity through John Haydeck, Le Corbusier, Mies, uh, it was something that uh, had, was new work to me, and I began to speculate about what it would mean for architecture. Uh, to do that, we began a data research project. 25,000, 9,000, excuse me, five, $9,500 vouchers in the city of Houston was worth about $225 million in terms of aggregate value. Was that a lot of money or was that a little bit of money? If you're a Republican, it might sound like a lot. If you're a Democrat, it might not sound like much. Excuse me for characterizing Houston, Texas uh, politics. But in terms of putting it in a context, we began to see it differently. In the case of Houston, that year, $560 million worth of freeway construction had been contracted. Uh, $1.4 billion was under contract. 
one 8.1 mile stretch of freeway in the city of Houston that you see eclipsing a house here cost $181 million or almost as much as 25,000 down payment vouchers. Clearly roads make money, building doesn't particularly make money, they're not an easy comparison. But we began to assemble data to try to find out what was the territorializing role of the voucher program in, in response to other predominant infrastructural systems such as freeways and Detroit, the dominance of the automobile and the energy industry. Uh, another piece of data that was given to the 16 architects who participated was the idea that ownership was better than renting. In the case of a, of a low-income house, uh, the type that was being built by the Fifth Ward CRC, I'll get to this in a moment, uh, the average house was costing about $70,000. The average mortgage after state and federal subsidies was about $50,000. The average house in Houston was sold every nine years. At nine years, you would have spent $36,000 on mortgage payments to accrue about $3,400 worth of equity. My numbers might be slightly off. It's been three years since we did this carefully. But the idea was, in fact, that the banks are making the money until you actually own the project. Uh, the third piece of information given to the architects was an analysis of single-family homes, developer-type tracked homes that the federal government's voucher program was moving architecture towards. Uh, we looked at a case study of 347 single-family houses built outside the Houston city limits near compact computers in one of Houston's edge communities uh, called FM 1960. Uh, those 347 houses were built for $16 million on land that was obviously not, not, highly, uh, not very valuable in terms of urban price. Uh, the architectural fees on $16 million worth of construction were $3,000, I'm sorry, $4,550. $13 a house, 0.026%. Uh, so the question was, as the federal government was atomizing in a, its, its, uh, its authorial will in the production of housing, uh, it was also atomizing professional services of architects to the point where whether or not architects wanted to be involved in housing or not, uh, there wasn't a professional mechanism to be involved in housing. This research began not in relationship to issues of poverty, not in relationship to issues of low-income families. It became, <clears throat> it was instigated more as a question about housing in the United States in general, the type of banal tract housing that exists all across this country. Uh, the architects, and I can't show the work thoroughly at all in this, in this frame of mind, so I'll show three projects. If there was more time, I would show all 16, which were extraordinary, in each in their own way. But they made a range, they range from a proposal by Mark Womble and Don Finley, which you see on your, I think it should be your upper left, called the Clip House. They proposed keeping the $225 million consolidated, having a high-end R&D facility that could in fact produce a sophisticated housing product. But what they proposed was that the house would be clipped together by a binding system that they called the Clip. If I can figure out how this works. Well, I won't work on this. This uh, Womble and Finley proposed a clipping system that would that would link together the sections made by Igloo, Cooler, Sony corporations that had high-end R&D that was still consolidated, that had not faced the crisis of consolidated wills such as housing authorities. Si Chung Leong, Judy Chung proposed ten houses known as the Variable House, a realizable project that was composed of off-the-shelf parts that could be reassembled. Uh, in the end, seven of the 16 houses received funding to go through working drawings, and in December, two broke ground, Carlos Jimenez and Deborah Morris, probably two of the most conservative of the 16. The others may or may not go forward. They're being done as speculative projects. My own project set the stage for the work in New York. It was called Glass House at Two Degrees. It was done while I simultaneously curated the show and did the research, and it was a mixture, a kind of hybridization of being an optimistic project about the potential of the program. Indeed, it was successful in many ways in stabilizing the Fifth Ward. It was a good thing. It is part of a renaissance. But the house, in its transparency, in its fracture, in its bending, and in its off-the-shelf parts, was also a kind of projection of a quasi-coalition uh, with the program both saying it's a good thing, but also using the transparency in many ways, uh, almost making the project a monument to something that might come that's better. Uh, the houses that were being built by the Fifth Ward CRC, you see one on the left side, on the upper left. It's a neighborhood that was 98% African American, subjected to almost all of the pollution tendencies in Houston. I could show you diagrams that show that the Fifth Ward receives every major polluter, EPA registered polluter in Houston. Rice University, the Medical Center, Fifth Ward, West University received none. Um, but the houses being built in the manner of urban renewal, I'm sorry, urban new urbanism, 
uh, were sort of positing that that painful history, in fact, had never happened. And uh, we were interested in looking for a way to both push the project forward because people deserved a better house, but also to not ameliorate the complexity of the history of the Fifth Ward. $7,700 a year, average housing income. Uh, West University, next to Rice University, is $150,000 a year. One all Caucasian, one predominantly African American. Uh, we did lots of time-based diagrams. Uh, there's a uh, mortgage system blob you're seeing on the upper right-hand corner, but it was a diagram that was uh, uh, based in the lowest tier of this diagram was looking at what type of, of financing is available at the bank level, what type of financing is available at the upper level. The upper level was Habitat for Humanity, the lowest level is the bank, this level was the voucher program. As you adjusted income and housing costs, the, the footprint would change. This is a very poor uh, copy of an animation. But the footprint would change, and you would find a, a situation where more or less housing could be built for more or less people within certain income strata. The lower the income goes, the less the banks would support it. The lower it went, the higher uh, Habitat for Humanity's support would go. That work uh, is is, is still underway, but what I wanted to focus on today was how that project led me to New York and led me to a project with the New York Department of Housing Preservation and Development. Uh, in Houston, we proposed 16 houses for the Fifth Ward Community Redevelopment Corporation that would be supported at the point of sale. Here, w I was commissioned uh, to do an exploratory research project for the New York Department of Housing Preservation and Development, a, a private-public partnership of the City of New York for a site on the Rockaway Peninsula called Arvern by the Sea. And you can see that right here. Manhattan is right here. Columbia is right up here. Uh, Arvern by the Sea is, um, uh, the peninsula is home to 38,000 households. 13,400 of them are publicly subsidized in one form or the other. Unlike most of New York City public housing, which is highly distributed within the urban fabric, this is actually the greatest concentration of public housing in the city of New York. One in 12 New Yorkers live, within, live in publicly assisted housing. Uh, I worked in a similar way as I did in Houston. I did several research projects on it with students and independently. Uh, the city funded us partially to do the research as did the Architectural League of New York. They also invited t uh, three other teams, one led by Peggy Deemer, one by Michael Sorkin, and one by uh, Rainier de Graff from OMA, Rem Koolhaas's firm. Uh, how you could moonlight while you work for Rem, I can't understand. but that, that's. <laughs> Apparently it can be done because they did a great project. Um, the, the, our site was 308 acres of property right here, which was cleared in 1968, one of the last acts of slum clearing, uh, when they would still call it slum clearing, but also one of the last acts of urban renewal, which is in fact a law, not a form. Um, the site was right at the junction of the A train, which comes across Jamaica Bay. Here's JFK Airport. The A train comes across Jamaica Bay. Its last stop is Far Rockaway uh, to the west, I'm sorry, to the east, and its last stop to the west is uh, Naponset and Breezy Point. Uh, this is the view of the site. The 308 acres were cleared in 1968 and subsequently never redeveloped despite numerous proposals. The firm Aaron Krantz and Exeter just recently won the RFP to join a development team to do this project. Ours is an advisory project. We have had many meetings with Aaron Krantz to talk about what they'll do. But the project has been contentious uh, since it was cleared, and it was in fact cleared through contentious processes in general. At this point in time, the 100 acres that has recently been released for the RFP is right here. It's ringed on three sides by three different histories of public housing that span the 20th century. Uh, it's ringed by the New York City Housing Authority here and here, the Urban Development Corporation here, and the Mitchell Lama Cooperative Program here. And then this land is owned by a fourth entity, which I've discussed, Housing Preservation and Development. Uh, the, the, the Housing Authority property was funded initially in 1934 through the Wagner-Stegall Act. Uh, it is as the Chicago Housing Authority or the San Francisco Housing Authority or, or the Houston Housing Authority, it's federal funds that will rent, ultimately provide housing that they maintain ownership of that in the case of New York will be rented for 30% of your monthly income, whatever your monthly income. In the case of the Urban Development Corporation, this housing was funded in 1968. Uh, I'm told by Paul Beyer, the UDC's chief counsel at the time, that it was funded the day after Martin Luther King was assassinated. 
uh, it was New York State Housing Fund. They built 36,000 units, approximately, of housing over six years before their funding was cut in 1974, uh, ultimately at the federal level by Richard Nixon's administration. And then the, or then the Mitchell Lama program, if I get to give you that picture very quickly. Oops. I'm sorry. The Mitchell Lama program funded in the, in the late 60s and 70s as cooperative ownership housing intended to provide medium income housing for the quote unquote middle class in New York with the idea that other, everyone else was being subsidized in one way or the other. Uh, the land was cleared, as I mentioned, in 1968 and has stayed that way. Uh, in the late, early 1980s, the proposals for, were as high as 10,000 units for the 300 acres, approximately 30-something units an acre. The current RFP is for 8 to 12 units an acre, which is, and actually mentions providing new urbanism. Like the em emblem that Gary has placed on the poster, it's a similar situation of a commodified, highly structured housing type meeting in an ecologically sensitive piece of land. Um, this is not going forward. Uh, the approach to Far Rockaway uh, includes coming across the Jamaica Bay. On, the, on your left, you should see the, a type of housing that actually is almost, has almost become docklands. But as you reach Far Rockaway and the Arvern sector of the area, the architecture is in a high state of disrepair. We began with a series of research documents again. In this case, we were looking at the value of housing, the value of incomes, and the type of housing that different, uh, different groups were, were accommodated with. Uh, as you look down this diagram, this is Far Rockaway, where the peninsula joins Queens. This is Neponset and Breezy Point, the, the final end of Long Island. At the western end, the, the population is almost entirely Caucasian. The income is 225% of Queens median income. Everyone lives in a single family house. In Arverne and Edgemere, the site of the public housing, 50 units or more, approximately 20% of Queens median income. Uh, in terms of looking at the history of housing policy, this is a somewhat incomprehensible drawing at this scale, but this is an Excel chart that begins in 1934 and charts different attributes of the first federal housing policy, the Wagner-Stegel Act, to the year 2000. This marks the year 1968, a major transformation sector, I'm sorry, 74, a major year of transformation under the Nixon administration towards a more conservative reading of the, of the housing policy, and finally, in the Clinton administration, a move towards voucher programs. But these were diagrams that were attending, attempting to sort of see the construction of this site through the construction of historic policies and uh, numeric and financial.